Sunshine Novak, the biker psychologist. I am sitting outside in my beautiful yard, uh, my backyard that I really love and enjoy being back here. It gives me a sense of peace and tranquility. Um, having a, a little bit of coffee, if you follow my content, you know that means it's morning time because I don't have any caffeine after about 9.30 or 10 a.m. in order to protect the quality of my sleep. Uh, and I am drinking it out of my uh, mug that has my, my catchphrase on it. <laughs> this has become my catchphrase for those listening and not watching. It says, I'm a ray of fucking sunshine. So when my um, Baca brothers and sisters, when Bikers Against Child Abuse, gave me the name Sunshine, it was, if you can't tell, given with a little bit of sarcasm because I am from New Jersey and consistent with sort of people in the northeast of this country I have a, a bit of a maybe a resting bitch face you know and uh, so they gave me the name sunshine uh, to refer to my sunny New Jersey disposition and when they gave that to me they also gave me a patch for my vest that says I'm just a fucking ray of sunshine and since then uh, my partner Foxglove has uh, gotten me a mug, a t-shirt, and all kinds of things that say that on it. So uh, I am enjoying my morning. I hope you all are too. And uh, what I thought would be interesting to get into today would be uh, sort of a compare and contrast between the ideas of growth, or specifically post-traumatic growth, but any kind of personal growth, versus resilience. And um, what I will say is, from an academic stance, these are two very distinct um, ideas, uh, especially post-traumatic growth versus resilience. Um, I would say, what they, from an academic stance, what they both have in common is that they are both forms of growth, and that, that's true. <clears throat> and I say an academic stance because, in practice, um, they become less distinct, they become more similar. And, I, and I'll explain that a little bit. So let's start with what are the, the differences between these things um, academically. So the idea of post-traumatic growth uh, came from observation. It came from, from the observation that people who had a history of trauma and uh, suffered PTSD, and this is an important distinction because not everybody who experiences trauma suffers PTSD. In fact, the research estimates that only about 30% of trauma survivors actually suffer PTSD. Now, many more suffer what's called acute stress disorder, which is a set of symptoms that occur right after a stressor. Um, but most people kind of bounce back from that. Uh, PTSD suggests longer duration, right? It goes on for months, uh, sometimes years after a trauma. And um, it does have a set of symptoms that's slightly different from acute stress disorder, but they're fairly similar. So um, the idea is if you experience a stressor, if you experience a trauma, and you don't have any real symptoms. Maybe you have some upset, you know, you're, you're bothered by it, but no real symptoms per se. Or if you have a few symptoms, but they don't quite reach a certain threshold, then you don't have any diagnosis at all. That's how diagnoses work. Um, if you do immediately after the, um, immediately after the trauma, you have uh, a set of symptoms that reaches a certain threshold, and that threshold usually has to do with causing functional impairment in your life, um, then you have an acute stress disorder. And the, the belief generally is that that will resolve, 
within two or three weeks. Uh, however, if your sy sy symptoms persist beyond that, that length, beyond a couple of weeks, um, and also reach a certain threshold, then you would have PTSD. So um, what researchers noticed is, uh, first of all, that PTSD does seem to get better with treatment. In fact, um, I would say, and, and I don't know that there's research to support this, it's just my experience from 12 years of being a therapist, but I would say that um, PTSD is among the most treatable mental health issues. Uh, and I don't know if that's by nature of the, the diagnosis or if that's just me as a therapist because I did a better job of treating that than I did other things. But it seemed to me that uh, people I saw who had depression or anxiety, um, things of that sort, uh, it was very hard. I mean, you could make temporary improvements and things would go up and down, but those conditions seem to persist quite a long time. <laughs> Uh, my experience with PTSD is once you actually get into the real treatment of it, which is usually some combination of uh, psychological and physiological treatments, <coughs> excuse me, people would improve quite rapidly. So um, the hardest part about treating PTSD was getting people to want to do the treatment. People with PTSD are very motivated to not have to think about their trauma or deal with their trauma or write about their trauma or anything. They're, they're very motivated toward avoidance. And while it's not always necessary to talk about your trauma with a therapist, there are methods of treatment where you don't necessarily have to discuss the trauma. It is important in all forms of treatment to re-experience it to some degree, to have some memory or some physiological kind of uh, remembrance um, because those are the windows in to do the treatment without that the tr we're not treating anything right um, so what the researchers noticed is as people got treatment for their PTSD and their PTSD started to improve there was a population of people who uh, uh, the larger population of people would improve back to baseline, kind of back to where they were before the trauma, and go on with a normal life. But there was a, another population of people, a little smaller population, that for unknown reasons would recover from their PTSD and soar and just thrive and do so much better than, um, than they did before the PTSD. They would just kind of make meaning out of their suffering find some meaning or purpose in it that made sense to them and thrive and do amazing. Just suck the marrow out of life, really. Uh, they would have uh, improve their relationship quality, improve their life satisfaction, uh, and just do really well. And that's where the idea of post-traumatic growth came from. Uh, the research suggested that, that that kind of growth seemed to be related to the degree of suffering the person had in their PTSD. So what that means is people who had milder cases of PTSD seem to have milder amounts of growth, whereas people who had the worst PTSD had the greatest growth. Um, and so what they uh, took from that was that the suffering that the people went through in their very severe PTSD somehow contributed um, and was necessary for that type of growth. Now, what I would do as a clinician, uh, after a little while, I mean, sometimes I just, you know, when I was a newer, I would treat trauma and I kind of thought that was it. But as I got more and more interested in post-traumatic growth, uh, what I would try to do <clears throat> is I would try to plant the seeds during therapy that would um, facilitate that post-traumatic growth because in the research they weren't doing anything to try to create growth they were just treating PTSD and seeing who who had this growth and who did not so uh, as a therapist and I'm not the only one there are others that that did this as well there's a sort of a school of thought around this uh, a population of therapists who 
thought, well, if this growth happens, if it occurs and it's possible, let's see what kinds of things we can do to help facilitate it and make sure our clients experience it instead of leaving it random, right? Um, especially if we had clients who maybe were, did not have the severest cases of PTSD. According to the research, they were least likely to experience this kind of growth. And my thought was, well, that's if I leave them alone, right? But, but what if I can somehow nurture that, you know, create it? And so these are where the tools for this podcast, for all of the growth and thriving come from. The tools that were most successful in creating post-traumatic growth through observation and, and, you know, clinical case study, not through, uh, I never did large population research on this, but the tools that seemed to work the best were mindfulness, gratitude, um, meaning making, self-compassion, nutrition, and physical fitness, so overall physical well-being, and other lifestyle or I should say the absence of other lifestyle obstacles. So things like um, healthy relationships or the ability to get out of toxic relationships, <clears throat> financial well-being, so the ability to manage our finances and get out of debt and not feel uh, oppressed you know, by our financial situation, those things seem to contribute as well. And that's why those are the tools that I discuss in this podcast and on, on the rest of my content. Um, and so according to the research, what distinguishes post-traumatic growth is, first of all, it happens after the trauma. That's the biggest key piece. <clears throat> post-traumatic growth happens after the trauma. Um, another piece of post-traumatic growth, according to the research, is that the worse the PTSD, the, the bigger the growth. And I would say that's, that's probably accurate even if you are trying to foster growth like I do um, whereas resilience is a little different resilience occurs before the trauma so resilience is developed before things go to hell so you develop resilience for example if you're somebody who works out regularly and eats a healthy diet and maybe meditates and gets in a dry sauna two or three times a week and maybe does a cold plunge a couple of times a week, um, stretches, gets massages, you're somebody who's building physical resilience. And so your likelihood of experiencing uh, illness, uh, any kind of illness for this matter, but specifically like diabetes, heart disease, things like that, but even things like the flu, are decreased because your immune system is functioning better. Um, you're not gonna experience diabetes because uh, if you're eating well and exercising, you're gonna remain insulin sensitive, which is what we want, uh, and you won't become insulin resistant. That comes from blood sugar spikes and drops and spikes and drops. And if you're eating well and exercising, your blood sugar will go up a little bit with meals and down, but it won't spike and drop. And so that's the mechanism by which that works. If you're exercising regularly and eating a healthy diet, that keeps your heart healthy and your lungs healthy, and that's the mechanism by that way that works. But you'll also be more resilient towards things like the flu or even COVID, right? They found that um, people who stay fit uh, are more resilient to COVID than even people who have the vaccination. So, um, or have the vaccine, correct, have the vaccine. So. Um, these things are preventative. Resilience is preventative. So in terms of trauma, uh, people who live a lifestyle where maybe they journal and they pra practice mindfulness and they practice gratitude and maybe they stay physically fit because that does contribute to men mental strength um, and maybe they take care of other issues in their life like their relationships and their finances so that those are not additional stressors when a trauma hits. Um, those people are more resilient to trauma. doesn't mean they're unaffected. It just means the trauma has less of an impact when it happens. And so in the research, what they found, obviously, if, if the worst PTSD caused the greatest growth, well, people who were more resilient would have lower PTSD. And so um, people who had more 
Now they would call it emotional resilience because they're just working in a psychological field, but I don't necessarily believe in emotional resilience. I think it has to be holistic, right? It has to be physical and emotional and psychological. Those things are different. It has to be interpersonal, like in your relationships. It has to be professional, right? Your career has to be on a good trajectory, at least not a good, but a trajectory you're satisfied with, right? Um, you have to f have meaning in your day-to-day -to -day -to -day life, things that fulfill you. Um, those things make you resilient to the trauma, so the trauma has less of an impact. So, um, so in the research, people who were more resilient would suffer less PTSD, um, which means they would have less of this incredible post-traumatic growth. Now, you can get very deep in the weeds, but the simple way to think about it, and it's even simple, it's a little bit of a, of a brain teaser, but the idea is that people who were more resilient, and by the way, there are some people who seem to be naturally resilient without any of these practices. There are some people who don't necessarily practice mindfulness or um, self-compassion or um, people who don't, you know, take good care of their fitness or their, nutri their, their nutrition, and still they seem to be pretty robust, right? They don't get sick off, often, and they don't, um, you know, they don't allow toxic relationships to persist, and they're not easily knocked off kilter by traumas or stressors, uh, and they're just sort of naturally resilient, and, and maybe that's a genetic piece in their family, or maybe they're just lucky. I don't know what accounts for that, but some people just naturally seem to be. Um, I believe, my guess, my hypothesis, is that it has a lot to do with the environment in which we grow up. So I think if you are somebody who grew up in an environment where the people around you handled adversity with some grace and calm uh, and, and managed the degree to which they allowed their emotions to be upset and things like that, um, and that doesn't mean pretending you're not upset when you are. It means managing it in a healthy way versus managing it in a destructive way. Um, if you grew up with that as a model, my guess is that you probably, <clears throat> without even realizing it, internalized it and managed difficult situations similarly. Uh, whereas if you grew up in an environment where there was a lot of chaos and people would fall apart at that chaos and kind of become very emotionally, li um, you know, labile they would you know um, emote to extreme levels and be unable to function for days and things like that that would that's just what you would learn is normal right uh, it's not a judgment or a criticism it's just what you would learn right the same way if you grow up in an environment where people speak English you would learn to speak English if you grew up in an environment where people speak Mandarin or Cantonese or Portuguese or whatever that's what you would speak. It's not so much genetic, it's just what you were exposed to. That's my guess, I, I don't have data to support that, but that's kind of what makes sense to me. And so, and so going back to this comparison, the idea is that people who have this resilience, um, on the one hand, are less likely to experience this kind of growth after adversity or after trauma. On the other hand, at baseline, um, before the trauma, just that baseline, they're probably functioning better, their quality of life, and, and not better from like, I decide who lives better, but just if you were to ask them, their quality of life and their relationships and their sense of fulfillment and meaning in the world, it's probably higher than people who are less resilient. Um, and I would think that that's true of people who have health maintaining practices, you know, fitness practices and nutrition, uh, guidance guidelines by which they live and and um, people who maybe have some spirituality in their life um, whether you're religious or not spirituality in the research has demonstrated uh, to contribute to resilience and so uh, if you're more resilient you're less likely to have this post-traumatic growth but you are less also less likely to be knocked off the rails and into PTSD by a trauma and you're probably have a higher life satisfaction and, and a higher level of functioning at baseline than others.
By contrast, if you're less resilient, according to the research, and you experience a trauma, you are more, more likely to experience PTSD to some degree or another, which makes this sort of post-traumatic growth more likely. Um, as a clinician, as somebody working with people in the office and not just researching and studying, and I'm not trying to say just researching, I, I consider myself a researcher too, and I have great respect and I find great value in the research, um, but it's a little different when there's a human being sitting across from you in an office and you, you're trying to help them, right? It's just a different dynamic. And so, to me, I found that if I took some of these tools, if I could help my clients um, psychologically, if I could help them practice gratitude, if I could help them with emotional intelligence, EQ is a big one, with self-awareness, self-management, social awareness, and, um, you know, and uh, relational efficacy. Those are the domains of, of emotional intelligence. Um, if I could help them with um, meaning making or life purpose, if I could help them um, with fitness, if I could help them with nutrition, um, if I could help them improve the quality of their relationships, then maybe I could facilitate this sort of growth, post-traumatic growth with my trauma clients and, and increase the likelihood of my clients having that experience without just waiting to see who experiences and who doesn't. Well, then the idea was, well, maybe I can do this kind of thing and help clients build, build this kind of growth, even if they haven't had a trauma, right? Maybe I can optimize their life satisfaction. Maybe I could help them thrive, even if they haven't had a trauma. And so this is where, in my eyes, right, there's this difference in the research between resilience and post-traumatic growth. Um, I gave my, my son, my little 10-year-old just got up. It's Sunday, so he just woke up. So I was telling him to give me a minute because I'm recording. So, um, But in the research, there's this difference between post-traumatic growth and resilience. But my thought is, it was that if I could just facilitate growth in everyone, then maybe that distinction could become blurred, right? Um, and the idea, I guess, is if I could build resilience in everyone, then they'd be less likely to, ha to have PTSD after a trauma. They'd be less likely to suffer, you know, to a great extent. Everybody suffers a little, but to a great extent after a trauma. And more likely to live their baseline at a higher level than they would have otherwise. Um, now, my experience has been, and again, I didn't study this, haven't studied it yet, maybe I will someday, um, but my experience in, in clinical work has been that um, trauma and PTSD and um, suffering still seems to act like a springboard into post-traumatic growth. So what that means is the people I was able to convince to have these practices, to practice gratitude regularly, to do... Uh, to do practice self-compassion regularly in their life, to make meaning um, in their in their endeavors, make meaning in their work and in their relationship with their families and so on and so forth. And if I could help them have better relationship quality and help them with better physical health and well-being and help them with better financial health and well-being, that um, they would grow. And they would build, I guess, what the research calls resilience because they haven't had a trauma yet. And so they're building resilience. But overall, their life satisfaction is better than it was when they started seeing me, hopefully, right? And if they do encounter a trauma, then they're less likely to have that degree of suffering. They're more likely to bounce back. Um, these are the same tools that I would use if somebody came to me after a trauma and I hadn't met them before and I'd be working to help them resolve their PTSD. But during the treatment of their PTSD, I would be introducing these tools, hoping that it would help facilitate that post-traumatic growth, because remember, not everyone experiences it. Um, 
And in my experience, the people who practice it, even though they haven't experienced a trauma yet or haven't had, you know, aren't recovering from some sort of severe adversity, those people did grow, right? And they did improve and they did uh, do better. However, the people who suffered, who had PTSD or some other trauma related kind of or adversity, you know, adverse childhood experiences or something like that, um, they suffered below baseline for a while. But as they started to get better, more often than not, they shot even past the other people who were working in on it in good times. So what is my recommendation? I would not recommend waiting for a trauma or an adversity to occur and then seeing if you end up having severe distress like a PTSD and then hoping for post-traumatic growth to occur. I, that, I do not recommend that as a method for thriving. My method is to work on resilience regularly, to just make it part of your lifestyle, part of who you are. I'm sure that anybody watching or listening to this brushes their teeth at least twice a day. Hopefully we floss too, you know, for all the, the dentists out there. Um, that we wash our clothes regularly, right? We wash our dishes, we prepare meals. We have practices in our life that are not, we don't think of them as like, oh, I have to do this for my health or, oh, I have to do this for my um, well-being or whatever. They're just things we do, right? Because it's just our lifestyle. We don't want to walk around in dirty clothes. We certainly don't want to smell bad. And we also don't want bacteria and germs and things exposed. We, you know, we want, don't want our teeth to rot. So, we, you know, things like that. Well, if you do it long enough, things like, exercise even just 30 minutes four times a week right that's two hours out of 168 in a week um, but things like exercise things like um, eating a mindful diet full of whole foods and nutritious foods um, and again that doesn't mean you can't splurge once in a while but it's like the 80 20 thing if you are mindful about your diet 80% of the time, then you can splurge on birthdays or at weddings or whatever, or on a date night with your partner. Um, if you, you know, write in a journal three days a week, and as part of that journal, you end each journal entry with the things you're grateful for, three to five things for which you're grateful. You know, if you, um, manage your finances and make sure that you stay out of debt and that you have some emergency savings and that you're investing in something that will grow faster than inflation. That's how we protect our money. Um, you know, if you're managing your relationships in a healthy way, those things don't, they, in the beginning, they're effortful. In the beginning, they're things that you have to do and you kind of would like to sit in front of the television and binge Netflix and whatever, and, but you have to pull out your journal and write because you, know, you said you would. Or, but after a few weeks of that, after may, maybe 60 days or so, these things become habit. And once they're habit, again, it's like brushing your teeth. You don't think twice about it. You do it, hopefully, at least twice a day. But I'll tell you what, wake up one morning and kind of come downstairs or wherever, if you live on a single level, come into the kitchen, put on your coffee. Uh, if you drink coffee, if not, have some water, whatever, and forget to brush your teeth. And you will notice. You will notice that your breath tastes bad, that your teeth don't feel right in your tongue, right? And you will, it will remind you, oh, I have to go brush my teeth, right? If you're somebody who doesn't brush your teeth or if you have kids, right, especially when they're... 10, 11, 12, 13 years old, and they don't like to brush their teeth, um, they don't even notice if they don't, right? You remind them, hey, did you brush your teeth this morning? They're like, oh, no, I have to go. Because they don't even notice that their breath smells or tastes bad. Or, um, and this will be like that. It will be effortful in the beginning, and you'll have to force yourself a little bit. But once you get into the habit of doing it, stop doing it for a day or two or three or a week, and you'll notice you don't feel as good. If you don't exercise for a full week, you'll notice your body feels creaky and stiff. If you eat badly for three or four days in a row, you'll notice that you feel bloated and heavy and lethargic and maybe even like depressed. It does affect your mental health. 
um, or anxious. There's foods that absolutely contribute to anxiety. That's well known. Um, and you'll notice. So, so make the investment. You don't have to start day one by doing all of the things I mentioned. Pick one area, one area to start to work toward building resilience. So, you know, I still call it growth, even though the research calls it resilience. I still call it growth because it's all improving who we are. So start working on your finances if that's what it is. If not, start with, you know, 20 to 30 minutes of exercise twice a week until it becomes habit. Then add what's next. If you need help with this, reach out. Let me know. I'm happy to help. This is what I do. I coach people. So um, it doesn't mean I'm perfect at it, but it does mean I know the tools by which people improve. So reach out if you need help. But until next time, if you are, I, I want to thank you, of course, for your attention, for your time. Your time is such a valuable asset. I really value the time you spend listening or watching these podcasts. So thank you. I'm so grateful to have any size audience who finds value in what I do. Uh, if you like the content I put out, please be sure to give it a like, to comment. I love reading your comments. And please share it with your community. Um, let others know uh, that this content is out there. If you have ideas for other content or things I could do differently or better, please reach out. Let me know. Find me on Facebook. I have three communities. Growth and Thriving After Adversity and Hardship. Parenting After Adversity. And Leadership Skills for Badass Survivors. Get on one of those communities and reach out to me. Or find my Facebook page, Growth and Thriving, and leave me a comment there. You can certainly comment on YouTube on this video um, or in any uh, on Spotify or in uh, Google. I would love your reviews. Uh, and again, just thank you so much for watching and listening and sharing. And also, by the way, if you like this content, please subscribe. If you subscribe, it will make sure that you know when new episodes drop um, and when new content is available. Last but not least, if you go on the website growthandthriving.com, all spelled out, growthandthriving.com, um, you can sign up for my morning mindset emails. Every Monday and Friday, you will receive a short little email with maybe a, a 10 or 12 minute video clip with a, you know, a link to it if you want to watch the video on all of the tools I talk about. So breathe through the little snippets on nutrition, on improving your sleep on improving your relationships, on physical fitness, on nutrition, on you know financial well-being, managing money. So uh, you can sign up. That email is always free. You don't have to pay. Um, and I don't share your information with anybody. I will never sell it to anyone. So um, that's it for today. Thanks so much again for your time. And until next time, this is Dr. Jerry Sunshine Novak, the biker psychologist, saying just keep growing until you're thriving. Hey! <laughs>